Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of Covey here at uh, Brock University. Oh, and I think... And um, uh, we're live streaming uh, today. Uh, thank you. We're live streaming the Cubby Lecture Series today, so we don't have any face-to-face -face interaction, uh, but uh, we are able to live stream and we will post the video after the fact. So this afternoon, I'm pleased to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Jim Wilbur, who's our Senior Scientist in Viticulture here at the Institute. Uh, Jim is also an adjunct professor in uh, Brock's Department of Biological Sciences. And through both of these positions, he focuses on applied research and outreach for the Canadian grape and wine industry. The major component of his research program is focused on grapevine cold hardiness physiology and understanding how to maximize cold hardiness in our more sensitive Vitisvinifera uh, grape varieties. Other projects include grapevine clone and rootstock evaluations and novel freeze and crop protection strategies. Jim also works very closely with the industry on their priorities and provides knowledge transfer through workshops, seminars, research demonstrations, and more recently videos. And I think we just uh, recently posted uh, one of Jim's uh, videos to the Covey website that we're doing in conjunction with the Great Growers of Ontario. So one of these major uh, outreach initiatives uh, includes spearheading the Vine Alert Cold Hardiness Risk Management Program. Vine Alert is an interactive web-based grapevine management program, an early warning system for cold injury used by grape growers to mitigate the impact of cold weather events. So I'm now going to uh, turn the floor over to Jim so he can talk to us. Uh, about the past decade of his research on uh, uh, bud um, uh, cold hardiness, uh, freezing, and uh, and blankets. So with that, Jim, I'll leave it to you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to all those who are, who are joining today. I know we have tough competition with the, uh, the Prime Minister today, addressing uh, some serious issues. Um, I thought for this lecture, what I'd do is give it a kind of a fun overview of what I've been up to over the last decade, because this is the, the 10th year, I'm just entering my 10th year here at, uh, at Covey, and I uh, just want to tell a little story of what I've done, uh, and just thought this might be kind of an interesting thing of where we came from and where we're going. Um, so I've got kind of a quirky title, uh, a decade of freezing buds and blankets, the trials and tribulations of cold hardiness and freeze protection research. So in terms of cold hardiness research and outreach at Covey, um, I started in 2010, and we wanted to start some uh, research and outreach initiatives concerning grapevine cold hardiness. It was, a, it was a priority for the industry, and there was funding through the Great Growers of Ontario in partnership with Agriculture Agri Food Canada to develop programs to address one of the serious priorities of our industry uh, at that time and still is now, which is winter injury. Um, so, so and some of the research areas of interest was to optimize hardiness in Vitis vinifera, and then for outreach components was to develop a, a program to, to help monitor cold hardiness of the vines that we have throughout Ontario and to develop uh, mitigation and, and, and to work with mitigation freeze uh, strategies, uh, or, or sorry, to mitigate freeze injury uh, through various strategies. And one of those was to the use of wind machine technology. Uh, the industry had invested a lot in wind machines but they wanted a, a program to help assist them about when to use them to help mitigate uh, freeze injury, which we can have uh, cold temperature events on a yearly basis or multiple times a year. So this was an important program and priority for us to develop here. So I was happy to assist when I joined. So one of the largest programs was the, the Vine Alert Outreach Program, which is still running to this day. So this program has been running uh, for a decade now. Um, a lot of work has gone into this over the years, and it is our largest outreach initiative. And when it comes to a big project like this, just to get it off the ground, um, you need a lot of partnerships and, and good partnerships uh, with uh, multiple stakeholders. So we work really closely with the Grape Growers of Ontario, Ontario Grape and Wine Research Incorporated, as well as funding partners such as the federal government and with AFC, as well as uh, the provincial government. We also work clo closely with uh, some collaborations we still have now, uh, such as with uh, Kevin Kerr and Ryan Brewster at KCMS and, and Ryan now at uh, Brewster Consulting Services, as well as some weather monitoring through uh, weather innovations. And then obviously we're working closely with the industry 
So we're doing a lot of sampling and working closely with our growers and wineries across the province to help deliver this program. So what was you know, the, some of the first things we had to do? Well, this uh, is not only for outreach and for their final look program, but also for a lot of our research programs. So what's really interesting here, and, and I hope that I get the message across in this presentation, is that you know, a lot of the research that we do here at Covey, especially when it comes to coal hardness, is, is, is linked with our outreach and service programs as well. So what we learn from one area can really uh, dive into new research and, and build on, on things from what we learn from even our outreach programs, and, and that can lead to new uh, and novel research and research initiatives. So one of the first things that we had to do was uh, look at uh, an efficient way of monitoring cold hardiness so that we could actually deliver that information uh, to, the, to the growers and to see how our research trials were impacting cold hardiness. And through that, we, we worked closely with uh, Brock Technical Services here at the university, as well as colleagues across um, North America who have been using some of this technology to help develop and, and adapt uh, a new system for differential thermal analysis. We were actually able to measure uh, the cold hardiness of, of different buds uh, at the current levels of, of, uh, of hardiness. So ultimately what we created was a website to help monitor uh, cold hardiness. And all this information was stored in a, in a database online and also had some alerting functions. It has alerting functions to it uh, so we can alert the users during periods of risk. So ultimately this system stores, displays, and disseminates all of the cold hardiness uh, uh, information as well as any potential winter injury that we might see in a given year. So it's the largest cold hardiness database uh, that you'll find anywhere. Uh, we test tens of thousands of buds per year and all this data is stored in this, in this website or in this database. So what we do here is we display the information to the, to the growers in a, in a very friendly format uh, or for researchers as well. And what you can see here is there's various tabs. Uh, and one of the tabs here is, uh, is for bud hardiness. And so a, a grower or anybody can look at the, at the site and to see through these different uh, drill down menus, the location and the variety as well as the year of when this was sampled. So not only can you look at the most current information uh, in the most recent data uh, shown at the top here of the tables, but you can also look at historic information as well. So it's, it's a really good tool for looking at how things like this can vary from year to year. And we can have a lot of seasonal differences in cold hardiness. And we never really understood this until we started monitoring uh, this throughout our region. And you can see here for just one variety at one location over the last nine years here of data, um, you can see that the acclimation rates can differ in terms of how the plants are gaining cold tolerance, mid-winter periods, we can have a couple degrees difference from, uh, from one year to the next. And then the period of time or the stage of dormancy where vines are losing cold tolerance, which is cold deacclimation, we can see quite a bit of difference from, from year to year. And this is highly dependent on the type of weather that we have uh, during, uh, this, during the late winter and spring periods when the plants are eco dormant. They're only uh, dormant because of some type of stress. And in this case, uh, in many cases, it's due to uh, cool, cool temperature uh, stress. So when it's really warm, like in a year like 2011-12, you can see the plants uh, lost cold hardiness at a very rapid rate compared to one of our really cold winters where plants stayed dormant for a longer period of time. So without mo actually monitoring cold tolerance, we would have no idea uh, at any given time how hardy those plants are. And this is also a really interesting research tool for us to examine how different varieties respond due to our changing climate. So now with climate change, this historical data can be very, very useful for us in terms of what we want to target. And one of the things that I'm more interested in these days than ever is looking at this period of time, which is the cold deactivation. I'll talk about it later in the lecture. Another thing is with the vinyl work program, we're able to see how different varieties respond. Uh, not only how different seasons can vary, but also how different varieties can perform. And in this particular example, you can see how uh, six or seven different cultivars vary in terms of their winter hardiness. In a, in a variety like Merlot here at the top, you can see is much more tender 
in a variety like Chardonnay or Cabernet Franc or Riesling uh, at, that's at the bottom of the chart there. And then one of the key things that we have with this program is actually uh, indicating when a uh, winter injury may occur from cold weather events. And these are also periods of time where you see right here with the blue circle is when a, a grower would be running a wind machine, for example. When those minimum temperatures get close to our predicted cold hardiness, that's when we would turn on, or that's when we would turn on the machines and help mitigate that risk. So without knowing how hardy the plants are, you would have no idea actually when to run those machines. So we work very closely uh, with, with the growers on the current levels of cold hardiness so that they can set their wind machines to the proper temperatures. And that's going to change from the fall period when the plants are gaining cold tolerance to midwinter when the plants are generating at their maximum hardiness. Or now in March, for example, when we're getting warmer weather, those plants are losing cold tolerance. So we have to be on our ball and vinyl has to be, you know, the program has to be very active so that growers have the most current information to know what to set their machines to. If we do feel that there was an event where damage may have occurred, the next stage is looking at mitigation of that freeze injury. And through the final, or what we do is we, we uh, look at bud survival rates after these cold events, and we display that information for all the different regions and varieties that we're sampling to give the, the industry an, an idea of what kind of, or what level of damage is out there. So that they can look at mitigation strategies such as pruning, uh, leaving extra buds, to help mitigate any crop loss. So again, having that knowledge can help the growers um, have, make informed decisions. So the first uh, goal of Vine Alert is to mitigate any freeze injury from happening. And then the second goal is once there, if there is any winter injury, uh, then we help provide the industry with information so they can mitigate that, the damage. And finally, one of the things that we really wanted to establish with the program was to have a uh, alert functionality of the program. So anytime any new information is, is uh, posted to the website, uh, that information can get sent to, to a user. And the user can sign up for various alerts, depending on what they're growing and where they are. And uh, then that information can get to the, to the grower in a timely manner. Uh, the other uh, functionality that we have is to actually send out messages to update the industry on potential risks, whether it's uh, freezing temperatures or to look at uh, pruning strategies after a freeze event or to inform them that, you know, we're entering a uh, stage of deacclimation. Uh, so monitor our, our website uh, often so you can have the most current information. The one key thing about Vinaler and how this program has helped our industry is really looking at the economics of, of this program and, and how much freeze injury can really impact the industry. And one of the areas is obviously when, when you have winter injury, there's the direct crop loss. But then if you have wind machines, the other aspect is you won't only want to be running them when you need to. You don't want to be running them, um, you know, what we call recreationally. They're expensive to run, they're expensive to maintain, and they also make some noise. And as we have more, um, uh, development near our vineyards and people are living close to the vineyards, you know, we want to make sure that uh, you're not running them when you don't need to, to keep people awake at night. They generally run in the wee hours in the morning uh, or uh, when people are generally sleeping or trying to sleep. So through the program, what we've been able to demonstrate through some economic analysis, uh, third party through uh, the Goodman School of Business here at Brock, has been to look at you know, what kind of savings have we had with this program and what kind of benefits has it had from the industry? And one of the things here that I want to show you is just, if you just, just looked at recommended temperatures without actually monitoring the real-time hardiness of the plants, you might be running the machines where you don't necess necessarily need to, or you actually may be also missing potential freeze events, either which are bad, because all it takes is one night or one morning of cold weather where the temperatures drop below the critical uh, hardiness of the plants or the cold tolerance of the plants, and you'll end up with, with bud damage and potentially uh, significant crop loss. So all it takes is that one time. So with, through this program, we're running them only when we need to. Um, you can see here, if we were using just general guidelines, uh, we would be running the machines, such as in this instance here, which we wouldn't need to because the hardiness is all the way down here. And so we only be running them when these minimum temperatures exceed the tolerance or get close to it. And this is demonstrated here on that graph. And similarly, 
during this period of time, there'll be a lot of running of wind machines in the, in the late winter. Uh, looking at the month of April here, we, the machines will be running five or six times, uh, whereas we know right through the actual data, through the program, that we would be quite still cold tolerant during that period of time. So again, it's, it's, it's having a tailored uh, program and, and again, demonstrating that knowledge is power in terms of some helping you save money and running an efficient business. So how has Vinalert helped Ontario? Uh, just looking at Ontario alone, um, there's direct savings from directly protecting the fruiting buds. Uh, and in this case, uh, just, from, just from saving one, uh, from one cold event from the initial year, uh, over close to $14 million worth of production saved, uh, reduced wind machine usage, you know, we're looking at $1 million uh, per saving in fuel costs alone from only running the machines we need to. Those numbers are probably higher now, especially with the cost of fuel and so on, and bigger machines that we're using. And when there is winter injury to, to a vine, when you're looking at a woody perennial uh, crop, and it can take years to get those vines back into full production. So there's renewal costs, there's replacement costs. Even if the vine's not producing fruit, you still have to uh, manage those vines, prune them, uh, spray for disease and so on. So over a five year period, looking at another $30 million of savings, that's just from one cold event. So it's very, very uh, significant in terms of the economic savings, in terms of what vinyl can provide. And this is one reason why the industry has invested in wind machine technology. We have about 50% of our acreage is covered with wind machines. The other great thing about the program is education. Um, and it's helped improve farmer and neighbor relations. It also helped educate the community um, as well as government about freeze risks and protection. So initially when we first launched this program, people were hesitant in about wind machines. They're like, oh, do they really work? Uh, that type of thing. And now uh, through, through this program and, and how you know, working at Brock uh, closely with the community and with our, our industry, uh, this education has really helped um, in, enhance uh, our, our neighbor relations and, and you know, helps with policy and those types of things too for farmers. <clears throat> Ultimately, this is, a, I thought it was a really interesting slide in terms of, uh, again, through the economic analysis of Vine Alert, was how, how our industry has um, adapted new technologies and how it's translated into overall great production and increases in great production and or sustainability. And after some very cold winters in 2003, 2000, uh, in 2005, there were significant losses uh, due, to, due to freeze injury alone. And the growers started to in, uh, invest in wind machine uh, technology and adopting uh, this type of technology. And, it's, and it did help uh, improve some of the sustainability of the, of the crop, even though, uh, or rate reduction, even though we had some cold winters. But then once we introduced Vine Alert, we really, really uh, helped improve sustainability and even increase the, some of the crop uh, over the years. And this, this one only goes back to 2014. But 2014, for example, was a much, much colder winter and a longer prolonged winter than these events here back in 2003 and 2005. And it just goes to show you if with the right technology and with the right programs, uh, the, the crop loss was not as significant as other years. So another thing that we were wanting to look at and was um, you know, expansion of, of grape growing in non-traditional areas in Ontario. Um, there's, there's regions in other parts of Canada like Quebec, which have very cold winters, and some of these new regions in Ontario, for example, Prince Edward County, which is a, a, a newer uh, VQA appellation, uh, they've, they've got quite cold temperatures in the winter and they're growing vinifera grapes. We want to look at some uh, winter protection strategies to adapt that. Wind machines are used in the majority of our grape growing regions and they work really well under the right conditions. And, and if you look at the major production areas, uh, specifically the Niagara and the Lake, uh, you're almost at 100% coverage with our vinifera varieties in, that, in the largest production area. And the same thing across the Niagara Peninsula. Uh, it is the largest production area in the country and we use a lot of wind machines there. In other regions, wind machines work really well for, for, for frost protection in the tail ends of the season, 
but the minimum temperatures are just too low in some of those regions. And so vines traditionally have been buried there. If they're growing vinifera vines, they'll actually be buried with soil. But when you bury vines with soil, there's, there's some compromises that can happen. One is vine health. Uh, you know, plants don't like to be buried and uh, the yields can be quite inconsistent uh, because of that uh, process of hilling and dehilling. You know, you're damaging buds, buds are rotting and disease can set in too that, uh, that uh, can impact the, the overall vine health. So we want to look at an alternative strategy. And one of these alternative strategies was uh, the use of geotextiles. So we started this work back in like 2011, 12, um, and looking at uh, seeing this use of these, of these, um, these materials in Quebec, and they're experimenting, they're experimenting with them. But they really didn't know how they were impacting the, the hardiness of the plants and, and how well they really work. So we wanted to do some work uh, here in Ontario and look at uh, how, how they can impact um, the, the bud survival rate and the vine health and so on. So I'm just going to show you some, some brief slides just to really show you the main impact of them. And one of the key things is that with the geotextile textile materials, the coldest times of the year, so the minimum temperatures of January, uh, then this particular year, 2015, 16, um, temperatures drop down to below negative 22. And essentially under these materials, the temperatures were only negative 12. And they didn't really impact much of the hardiness of the vine either. So they were well protected with these materials, and not at any risk of any freeze injury. Now you look at this month in February, in 2015, 16, and temperatures dropped below negative 30. Now that's extreme for, for great production anywhere. But, and especially for vinifera, where you're looking at hardiness, you know, at, or cool tolerance of, of negative 20, negative 22, you know, maybe, maybe negative 24 at best type of deal. And so you're looking at negative 33, this would outright kill, a, kill the entire vine. But with the materials, what we found was that basically cut that minimum temperature in half. And they were only hardy, or sorry, they were, the temperatures uh, only reached about negative 15 at the vine level. So, and again, these vines would have been hardy to about negative 20. So there was no damage that occurred. So they were working quite well. Um, in, terms of, in terms of any greenhouse effects, we monitored the cold tolerance and of, of the vines below those materials as much as we could. And really there wasn't a lot of differences in terms of hardiness of, of vines that were uh, exposed to just the regular ambient temperatures and those below the materials. With that said, the only time there were differences were when the temperatures really started to warm up and the soils really warmed up in late March, April, and so on. And that's when um, you have to really be monitoring your, your external temperatures because you know that the, they will be uh, warming up uh, and also that, that can decrease the cold tolerance. So in some cases, growers have been using wind machines in, in conjunction with these geotextiles. So if there's some reduced hardiness uh, in the spring or earlier bud break, which can be an advantage in a short season, you need that wind machine there to help mitigate any potential freeze injury from frost. So here's just an example of a buried vine on the left-hand side and a vine that was covered with the geotextile on the right. And you can see that there's the, the, the uh, health of the canes uh, were quite variable uh, with the buried plants. Um, one of the problems was, is when you bury plants with large rocks and so on, and you have a lot of fluctuation in the winter, what happens is that soil can wash away and those vines can be exposed to really cold temperatures and that can result in damage. And that, that could be a, a real problem. And with variability that we're seeing in our winters, um, the geotextiles can help give you a little bit more consistent uh, coverage because those blankets aren't moving anywhere. And you can see that just the, the health of the, of the canes looked a lot better on the materials. And that the other thing that we found was that the yields were consistently higher uh, using the geotextiles. Um, the plants were, had more even bud break and they looked a lot better. Uh, growers are now using them across Ontario. More growers and wineries are starting to experiment with them and using them now at commercial operations. So most of the wineries that are using them have started off slowly, you know, doing an experiment for themselves for a couple of rows, and more and more people now are converting, slowly converting their entire vineyards, which is really interesting to see and really cool to see the benefits of your research and, and how it can be used. And, um, and especially to improve the sustainability of, of our industry. 
And some growers and wineries are reporting yield increases to be you know, 30% compared to their berry vines. Now they're having a problem that they're saying they have too much wine. I don't know if that's a problem. So uh, I'm pretty happy with, uh, with, with how this is, has gone. And uh, other regions across Canada are trying to experiment new un uh, non-traditional areas in British Columbia, for example, and uh, areas in the U.S. as well as some international regions have expressed interest and or even sort of experiment. So the other extreme that we're trying to deal with now is this whole issue of climate change. So we have regions that get very cold, but during the winter months, but we're also seeing warmer winters in general and a lot of fluctuations in temperature. And this erratic weather can cause a lot of problems when you're dealing with a plant that's a perennial plant uh, in, in dormancy because it, 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 uh, the plant uh, has, has little time to respond when there's huge differences and fluctuations. So one of the biggest risks probably is this warming during the endodormant or during the, during the eco dormancy when the vines are, um, are literally being held uh, in dormancy due to colder temperatures. And with climate change, this, is, this could probably be one of the greatest risks to freeze injury. Uh, more erratic winter temperatures, we have warming events followed by really cold extreme weather. Um, and we're seeing this in areas like uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, where we've had multiple years with uh, spring freeze injury. What we're having, what we're having is a shift in the seasons where the vines are uh, having bud break earlier in the year, but the risk of frost is kind of staying the same. And so this warming period, these warming periods can have some devastating consequences, particularly when the vines are getting ready to grow and there's a lot of water within the tissues. If that freezes, we can not only lose buds, but the entire vines. So this is one area where we've been focusing on more and when we first started to really see the impacts of warm weather on different uh, species of grapes, different varieties uh, through the Vine Alert program. This is one area where the Vine Alert program, you know, even though it's an outreach and a service tool, uh, it really helped drive a lot of research. And one of the things here I wanted to show is just how a different years can impact how a plant wakes up and it starts losing its cold tolerance. And you look at a very cold year, like 2014-15, you know, those plant, those Chardonnay vines were a lot more cold tolerant. They're still carbon to negative 20 uh, at the beginning of April, compared to a year like 11-12, where we had very, very, very warm, abnormal weather in March. And those plants at that same time of the year were only hardy to negative five. So what can we do to help reduce the sensitivity to deacclimate or how do different varieties perform? clones perform and so on. So that's kind of what I want to talk about next and how, how we can mitigate some of that risk that we might experience due to warming weather. And if you want to have a, 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 an example of how different species of grapes uh, uh, differ with respect to cold tolerance and how the environmental conditions impacts that, a perfect example that we've seen over the years has been through some of the uh, riparia-based cold hardy varieties. In a really cold year, a variety like Marquette and Frontenac, there can be very, very cold tolerant and, and, get, and get hardy to some of those levels that we saw uh, Prince Edward County where the temperatures were dropping to negative 30. But in a warm winter, what you'll find is that these varieties do not um, acclimate to the same, same degree and they're not as cold tolerant as they can be. So they, these varieties can actually be uh, more susceptible to freeze injury in a warmer year. So how do you, it's very difficult to uh, manage winter injury when it could be such so variable from one year to the next with the same variety. And in some cases, these varieties, even these really cold tolerant ones, in really every year, they've adapted to cooler climates. And so what they will do is they'll actually deacclimate at colder temperatures compared to a, like a variety like uh, Riesling, for example, or Chardonnay that evolved in Western Europe. And so they stay dormant at warmer temperatures, but these riparia-based um, hybrids, for example, they will deacclimate at, at colder temperatures and start earlier. So we'll usually start seeing deacclimation in these varieties in end of January into February, whereas with the vinifera, even if it's slightly warmer, we don't usually see them start to really move until March. And so this is a response that we've really been start trying to study and understand some of the 
uh, the rationale behind that and help mitigate that. One of the areas where we've been looking at improving um, the onset of dormancy, but later after doing more research, it was more about examining how to maintain dormancy and delay bud break and actually utilizing plant growth regulators to achieve this. And specifically, we, we started doing some collaborative work uh, looking at applications, uh, exogenous applications in the fall of abscisic acid and or abscisic acid analogs. And when it comes to abscisic acid, it's a really important plant hormone that you're going to find in all plants and it has a, a wide range of processes in plant growth and development. It's you know, generally called a stress hormone. Um, it's a response to, uh, to abiotic stress, uh, such as heat, drought, uh, as well as uh, some other aspects, such as uh, salinity stress or, or freezing as well. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it, like I said, it's, the, it's a stress hormone, and so it has a lot, it impacts a lot when it comes to growth and development. Uh, it's uh, involved with, uh, obviously, abscission and leaf senescence, uh, also involved with uh, berry maturation, uh, secondary metabolite production, and obviously uh, things like seed development as well. When it comes to specifically to cold tolerance, uh, ABA uh, enforces dormancy in buds, and it's, it's, it's highly involved in terms of induction and also as well as maintenance of dormancy. So the ABA levels within buds, for example, will uh, increase during acclimation and will, in that concentration of ABA within buds will decrease and, and get lower and lower, especially as you get into the deacclimation process. Um, it's involved in uh, inducing expression of genes that encode proteins to protect the cells from dehydration uh, interacts with other signaling molecules like calcium uh, to regulate cold tolerance responses. It uh, impacts expression of specific uh, cold hardness related genes like the CBF genes, as well as uh, inducing dehydrogen gene expression and accumulation of these core proteins, which are uh, uh, involved with, with cold tolerance. But just like everything with hormones, uh, there's a lot of complex interactions with abiotic conditions, and they're it's not all that well understood, to be honest. And there's a lot of uh, complex interactions uh, with ABA as well as other hormones, as well as the abiotic conditions. So it, one, of the, one of the molecules that we've been targeting in recent years has been uh, these abscisic acid analogs. And natural ABA, if you apply them on the vine, there's some, uh, or on a plant, uh, there's, there's some issues with it. Um, it breaks down easily. Um, it's, uh, it's susceptible to things like UV and so on and so forth. So it has some practical limitations and you have to use a lot more of it. These analogs are more effective than natural ABA. Um, one specific one we've been looking at was developed by uh, Dr. S uh, Susan Abrams, which is A prime, the A prime acetylene ABA analog. Um, it catabolizes more slowly in plant tissue and it also maintains high bioactivity. So you can use less of it, and it has uh, uh, enhanced or prolonged effects that we found when it comes to dormancy as well as, as hardiness. So one of the studies that we did was a collaborative study uh, across multiple regions, uh, some regions here in Ontario on the East Coast, so looking at East Coast conditions, and then a number of researchers on the West Coast. And essentially what we were looking at was different uh, exogenous uh, abscisic acid uh, uh, applications uh, and looking at how that impacts uh, phenology and bud hardiness in Merlot, which is a tender, um, a cold tender uh, grapevine, a different grapevine. So we essentially looked at uh, these different foliar applications of both ABA and the analogs in four distinct regions. Um, we looked at different concentrations uh, and so on, but we were, but I'm just going to talk more about the forms. Of, uh, of ABA that we use in the results. So one of the things that we found, and this was, we were really trying to look at improving the onset of dormancy, that was the original initiative. But one of the things that we found was that with the ABA analogs uh, specifically, we were able to delay uh, deacclimation and the plant would, was maintaining dormancy better with these analogs. And so that was quite interesting. We also found that uh, it didn't matter the year, but in this year, 11-12, was the year 
that I've showed you earlier where we had that really rapid rate of deacclimation where vines were only hardy to uh, negative five at the beginning of April. Well, with, this, with these treatments, uh, we were able to actually maintain the dormancy and those vines were quite a bit more cold tolerant in that given year. 2012-13 was a colder year, but one thing we did find was that here in Ontario, they seem to work even better. Um, we're not exactly sure why that is, probably due to water in the, uh, you know, and in our conditions that we have here. Uh, that, that was probably the biggest difference compared to the East Coast versus the West. And one thing we found was that in, the, in, this, uh, in this year, we found a little bit of difference in terms of they were actually improved the acclimation slightly, so they did improve the onset of dormancy, but again, we had this delay in deacclimation, which was, uh, again, quite significant and very noticeable as well. And we were seeing a delay in bud break of a, of a full week. So if you're in a, a frost susceptible region uh, where you can have spring frost, you know, that extra week might buy you some time and or help mitigate when you have those extreme warm temperatures that can uh, increase your risk of damage. So here's an, just an example, and the picture I had didn't show up, unfortunately. But uh, th in this case, we're just showing you how the, some of these different treatments, the 30158 uh, was the analog, and even at the lower concentration of 100 ppm, we were getting the same benefits as if it was 1,000 ppm, or, and we were able to delay bud break uh, significantly. And you can see here at the end of April, the control vines were pretty much at 100% bud break, and, the, and the, uh, the analog treatments have barely pushed anything. And with uh, some of our more current research we've been doing, uh, we're seeing this similar type of effect. With some new analogs, as well as the A-prime acetylene, we are seeing uh, a, a, a big delay in bud break of up to two weeks even, in some cases, uh, looking at Sauvignon Blanc or Merlot grapevines. And the neat thing is, is that you have a delay in phenology this, was, this is actually some Washington data here from that same study that we did. And there were significant differences in terms of the growth of the vine and the phenology of the vine with the analog treatments compared to the control or regular natural ABA. But by the time we got close to fruit set in the, in the berries were pea size, the, the, the vines had caught up. Now, we've been looking at tailoring the, our, our concentrations now a bit more because with our two week delay in bug break, we are seeing some differences in fruit composition late in the season. There's still, the varieties are still meeting their VQA minimums of, we're still having Merlot with 21 to 22 bricks, but uh, the, the, some of the other treatments may have 23, 24 bricks. So we're, we have a little bit of a, a delay in maturity uh, if we have a huge, huge uh, delay in bud break of two weeks. In. It's, uh, I had a picture there, but good to see it because it's, it's kind of scary. And this is some of the newer data that I have uh, that demonstrates that. So you can see here, um, not a lot of difference during the cold acclimation period, but then once we start getting into deacclimation, you know, looking at the middle of February and the vines are starting to lose that cold tolerance, some of these, uh, the control is the red, by the way, where there's no applications at all. And the natural uh, ABA is this uh, thinner uh, maroon line and you can see here that those vines have deoculated a lot more, whereas some of our different analogs have maintained a heck of a lot more dormancy. And even at the end of April, some of these vines were still hard at negative 20. So you're not gonna get negative 20 temperature, I don't think, in April, at least not the current status of things. We'll see what happens with climate change. But um, again, we're just showing you the range of how effective these can be and how they can vary at different concentrations as well. So it's a really powerful tool that we're gonna try and investigate more. And we've just got some current uh, funding that we just received from OGWRI. We want to look at how these analogs uh, reduce the sensitivity of not only just one vinifera variety, but also looking at uh, multiple varieties of vinifera to see how uh, these analogs work versus so treated vines versus untreated. And uh, also looking at some hybrid varieties we're also looking at right now, such as Marquette. So can this be a tool where you can get a really, really, really hardy grapevine that's not going to be as sensitive to deacclimation? 
So we're we'll working right now with, uh, with Dr. Charles Dupre at, uh, in Biological Sciences, who's a molecular biologist and plant chemist. And we're gonna be targeting key genes on, on both treated and untreated grapevines. And we're hoping this could further understand uh, the analogs of improving uh, hardiness and looking at this at the molecular level. So finally, the last thing I wanna talk about is we've been talking, or I've been talking about how varieties can differ from uh, and with respect to hardiness and the environment can have a big impact. And climate change is going to be one of the biggest threats that agriculture is going to face across the world. Um, you know, and we're, we're dealing with a, a crisis right now with a virus uh, that's impacting humans. And these types of things will only get worse with climate change, but and agriculture is going to be impacted as well. And we need to have a sustainable, I uh, want to improve sustainability of agriculture. But we're looking specifically at grapevines here. So we're looking at improving sustainability through optimal uh, vine selection. And when you look at our industry and, and many industries across Canada now, uh, they're focusing more on the vinifera cultivars. One thing we found through, our, through the vinyl program and just through our cold hardness outreach in general, that after a cold winter, and we, after we had some really, really cold winters with the polar vortex uh, seasons, we found that not all cultivars or even clones of cultivars had similar survival rates. There'd be a block of Chardonnay, one half would look great, the other half wouldn't. And we're like, why is that? And you're looking at things like drainage and crop levels, all that type of thing. And ultimately it just seemed like it was, in fact, they're different clones. So we started looking more and more at clones and we started doing some preliminary research and we were finding, you know what, there's actually are some differences here with respect to some other levels of cold tolerance. The industry was also really interested in learning more about uh, clones and rootstocks for our region. And finally, the industry was, was uh, creating uh, a clean plant program. So with the Canadian Grapevine Certification Network, there was a real need to also have a formal evaluation program to complement this program. So not only do we have clean vines and a domestic program, but then we're also having the best plant material for our particular regions. We have a lot of diversity, not only within Ontario, but across the country. So we wanted to look at specifically how uh, clones and rootstocks can impact uh, performance of grapevines, you know, better cold tolerance, uh, better uh, disease resistance, and so on and so forth. And the ultimate goal was to create a long-term solution to mitigate climate change. And plant material really is the, the best way to, to mitigate and to build, uh, to, to mitigate climate change and to build uh, a quality and consistency in the consistent industry at the same time. So currently we're doing some cultivar or clone rootstock evaluations, uh, working closely with our funding agencies, Ontario Grape and Wine Research Incorporated, as well as through uh, an NSERC CRD. So we've been doing this work for the last number of years. Uh, and also establishing industry partnerships, uh, working again closely with our industry on these projects and having uh, formal research evaluation plots at uh, commercial sites of different soils. And then we have different clones and rootstock of corn varieties. So this is longer term research that we've already started. Just to show you an example how Chardonnay alone can, can differ in terms of cold tolerance with respect to clones. And this was just in one season of looking at 12 different Chardonnay clones. And what we found were that the vines could start at different levels of cold tolerance to start the dormant period. Uh, and then ultimately they can have different levels of tolerance throughout the season. This is looking at one, uh, one variety and all these different types of clones. So this was some of the preliminary work that we did. And now we're investigating that in more detail. Similarly, you can see a response here from two different cultivars in the same location. Uh, the, the bluish green colors are uh, looking at Sauvignon Blanc. And you can see this cultivar is a lot less sense or a lot more sensitive to the cold or less tolerant, I should say, than, uh, than a variety like such as Riesling. But even within the species of, of or sorry, even within the varieties, um, there can be some differences that are clonal related. And some of these can be uh, fairly consistent um, in some cases, not, not too consistent, and there can be some differences in terms of the growing season can really have an impact 
where some clones can perform differently if it's a dry season uh, versus a wetter season or warm winter or cold winter. So this is why we're doing these studies over a number of years to look at the, the, the impacts of how this material performs under uh, Ontario or Canadian conditions. So moving forward, this is uh, ultimately not the next five years, but as I really want this to say uh, over the next decade, since we're moving to the next decade, but we're now looking at uh, a, a partnership with Agriculture Agri Food Canada and a, and a national uh, green cluster program through the uh, through funded uh, through Canadian Grapevine Certification Network and funded through the AFC's uh, AgriScience Cluster Program. And so the, the the title of the program is Fostering Sustainable Growth of the Canadian Grape and Wine Sector. So it's a large collaborative uh, initiative to look at everything from uh, viruses and the impacts of viruses, mitigating viruses, to uh, vineyard management, to cold halt tolerance, and, uh, and, and clone and rootstock evaluations, and everything kind of in between. So with some of this research, we want to continue to evaluate many of the varieties that we grow here in Ontario uh, for hardiness and understand more of those environmental influences. Like I said, we're really interested to see uh, looking at um, establishing models for the future and how vine hardiness responds to climate and how different varieties respond. Ultimately looking at uh, the best quality um, for clone and rootstock combinations, so evaluating them for uh, as a vine to glass approach through vine performance, fruit quality, and wine quality, and then ultimately trying to find uh, potential selections with greater resistance to freeze injury. So can we actually find uh, plant material that perform consistently across Canada and have greater cold tolerance? So if they perform well in Ontario, would they perform well in BC, Nova Scotia, and so on? So with respect to this, the two main initiatives that I'm involved with is this uh, grapevine evaluation coal hardiness program uh, and with the, some of the objectives that I've already stated here to basically look at evaluating grapevine material for performance, cold tolerance and quality to help improve the industry and sustainability of the industry, as well as assist with selection of superior plant material uh, for the CGCN and future plains across Ontario. As we, as we build on our, on our quality of our vinifera and continue to, to uh, have a, a, a ultra premium uh, quality um, wine industry here, which we have through, through a lot of our, our VQA uh, programs. So with that, uh, looking forward to the next 10 years of research. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge all of my uh, colleagues and technicians uh, and everyone else I've worked with, and obviously all of the uh, all of the partners that, that we've worked with over the years, uh, including the Great Growers of Ontario, Ontario Great and Wine Research Incorporated, as well as all of our grower collaborators. We have so many of them, and then our our, our funding agencies uh, from the provincial and federal governments as well. Without all these partnerships, we can't do anything, and I think that's also helped to really build the success of. Uh, the program and my 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 tenth year here at Covey. A lot of this has to do with uh, all of the partners, all everyone we've worked with over the years. So thank you. I uh, hope you enjoyed watching from afar, and uh, stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Are there uh, any questions that you'd like to ask Jim or Online? There are. So Bill Clark has kind of a multiple problems question that we need to kind of it's essentially looking at cost. Um, these are, I guess, um, it's prohibitively expensive, but he doesn't know to what extent. So he's looking at mostly capital investment, um, the annual cost of the cash hours, depending on taking them off, and the installation cost of the like it. Yeah, in terms of in terms of the material, it's going to it's going to vary in terms of um, how many how much material you buy at once. Uh, the more you buy, the cheaper it can be. But you're looking at you know up to five thousand dollars an acre of material. The material can uh, last for a long period of time. We think uh, you know if, if if you install it correctly and you're not tearing the the fabrics, or not getting caught on wires and on vines and so on, that the materials can last uh, upwards of a decade. Uh, some people have material in Quebec that they've been using for almost that long. Um, 
installation costs will vary as well, depending on the type of setup that you have. But generally, it's not much more than point of nets, really, if you have the if you have the proper infrastructure in the field. So we have some guidelines um, on a on a, a report that's that's available on the Great Growers of Ontario websites. Uh, and then what I'm also doing is, is networking with other wineries and so on that have been doing this because each each supplier and, and user has been doing slightly different things that have worked for them. And so some people find, you know, doing installing it one way uh, works really well and someone else uh, might say, yeah, you know what, I tried that, but I find this better. So it's, we're still starting to use it and trying to figure out the best ways of, of, of putting it on for your particular vineyard application. But it does work the best if you're actually able to install it um, low to, to the ground. If you try to tent it up too high, it's not going to have the benefit. So if your vines aren't trained uh, low to the ground, it's going to be difficult to, to have geotex geotextiles are going to be uh, working well for you. We have trialed them in high vine trellising situations and they haven't been very effective at mitigating the temperatures. And there was a lot of issues with the materials blowing around because if you tent them very high, you're basically creating a sail and the wind will really catch them and you will not get uh, a lot of temperature mitigation. You need to have um, a high surface area of with the material in the in the soil. So you want to have uh, not really steep uh, tented uh, fabric, but you want them uh, spread out more and how get that more of that surface area of the soil. I have another question. Uh, what about trialing more disease and cold tolerant vinifera hybrids from Northern England? I'm sorry, University of Canada. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're trying to get some more of that. Oh, we, we're, we are interested as soon as we can get material into the country. Uh, that would be really interesting to do, uh, to look at some of the, the new cultivars. Um, and we, through the vinyl program, we've looked at probably over 50, over 50 varieties. So we're always interested to trial new material as it comes into the country. Uh, right now, there aren't any of those Italian varieties available to us and or being grown yet. But our, I have talked to some growers who are interested in them. So I am interested to see what the cold tolerance of those varieties would be uh, here in, in Canada. Yeah, because our, it, you know, disease resistance is a big, uh, a big thing when it comes to um, sustainability. And uh, there, there could be a use for those, that type of material here in, in Canada. Well, uh, Jim, thank you very much for a, a very uh, interesting uh, view over the past uh, decade. Can't believe it's been a decade, All right? right? Yeah. Sure uh, so there's a, a little uh, gift and thank you card thank uh, you very much. from us. And I please uh, 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 invite you to join us again next week uh, for our next lecture, which will be given by Dr. Belinda Kemp. She will present her lecture, The Effect on Honey, Dusty Off Flavors and Acetic Acid in Sparkling Wine Made from Varying Amounts of Sour Rotten Grapes. Uh, so our plan is to continue to live stream uh, next week, uh, but please uh, continue to monitor our website uh, at covey at brockview.ca forward slash ccovi for updates um, in terms of any uh, scheduling changes that might um, occur between now and now. So thank you very much. <laughs>